everyone and welcome to Reading with Mrs. Adams. I'm Mrs. Adams and today I have stories and poems and even a little song and dance all celebrating St. Patrick's Day. So get ready because we're going to start with a little song and dance. It's called The Wearing of the Green and it goes like this. Today is the day for the wearing of the green. Today is the day when the little people are seen. Today is St. Patrick's Day, so if you're Irish, me lad, join the celebrating for the grandest time to be had. You put your hand up in the air, the other hand on your hip. You tap your toe, you tap your heel, you bounce your knee a wee bit. You prance and dance around the room in circle one, two, three. The saints be praised, I must admit, y'all look Irish to me. The first story I'm reading, boys and girls, is called Jamie O'Rourke and the Big Potato. This is an Irish folk tale, and it's retold and illustrated by Tommy DePaula. You're going to love these endearing characters, Jamie and Eileen, as they discover that it's not always the easy way that's the best way. I hope you enjoy this delightful story about Jamie O'Rourke and the Big Potato. Jamie O'Rourke and the Big Potato, an Irish folk tale, retold and illustrated by Tommy DePaula. A note about the story. My Irish grandfather, Thomas Lawrence Downey, was a great storyteller. I loved his rendition of the Animal Fair and his explanation of why he was bald. That will remain a personal secret. I never tired of sitting on his knee, and later, when I was a bit too big, sitting on the floor at his feet, with one of my baby sisters on his knee, listening to his wonderful tall tales. Among the stories I loved the best were the ones about the Irish, and the Downey family in particular. In those tales, I'm afraid, dramatic flair and artistic liberties took over for fact. But as any good storyteller knows, to embellish is to make the tale interesting, especially to a young Tommy. When I read the short tale that inspired Jamie O'Rourke and the Big Potato, I swear I could hear my grandfather, Tommy Downey, whispering in my ear, Jamie O'Rourke was the laziest man. Now I hope that the next generation sitting on someone's knees or at someone's feet will hear the words just as I did. Tommy DePaula. Jamie O'Rourke and the Big Potato, an Irish folk tale retold and illustrated by Tommy DePaula. Penguin Books for Young Readers. For my Irish buddy, John Sullivan. Jamie O'Rourke was the laziest man in all of Ireland. He would do anything to avoid working, especially if it had to do with growing potatoes. Jamie O'Rourke, his wife Eileen would say, will have nothing to eat this winter if you don't go out and dig up the pratties. Oh, the saints preserve us, Jamie would whine. Me back's as sore as can be, sure as I'm telling you, wife. You'll have to dig them up yourself. I'll break in two if I do so much as get up out of this bed. So Eileen, who had done all the planting and watering, weeding anyhow, would go out to the tiny garden and dig up the smallest potatoes in Ireland, all because Jamie was too lazy to dig a larger garden and had no money to buy good potato seed. Then poor Eileen wrenched her back and was laid up in bed. St. Bridget and the Virgin Mary herself must have smiled on Eileen O'Rourke, the village women said. Why, it's the first rest she's had since she married Jamie O'Rourke. With Eileen in bed, Jamie began to worry. No Eileen to dig meant no pratties all winter, and no pratties meant no food. Oh, poor me, wailed Jamie. I'll starve to death. I'd best go to church and confess to Father O'Malley. There's no telling how soon old death will be knocking on me door. So even though it was midnight, Jamie set out for the church. He was about halfway down the hill when he heard singing and a tap, tap, tapping sound. Sh 
sure and I wouldn't be knowing, Jamie whispered. But I swear it's a leprechaun. And sure enough, sitting in a circle of ferns in the moonlight was a leprechaun, singing and hammering tiny nails into the heels of the fairy boots he was making. Jamie knew just what to do. He crept up and grabbed the little man by his coattails and held firm. Let me go! Let me go! the leprechaun shouted. Not on your life, Jamie said. Not until you show me where you keep your pot of gold. Now everyone in Ireland knows that leprechauns make boots and dancing shoes for the fairies, who pay for them with gold. And everyone knows that if you catch a leprechaun, he'll pay for his freedom with his pot of gold. But this leprechaun was cleverer than most. Oh, please, mortal man, he pleaded. I'm just starting out making fairy shoes, and I only have one or two pieces of gold in my pot. Won't you take a wish instead? Why, what would I wish for? Jamie asked. Me, who's about to die of starvation because my wife is sick in bed and can't dig the pratties for the winter. And they're such puny pratties anyhow. Well, said the leprechaun, reaching into his pocket, you could wish for the biggest pratty in the world. It would last all winter and you wouldn't have to do anything more than plant this seed, water it, and wait. That sounded wonderful to Jamie. Done, he shouted. And as the leprechaun dropped the seed into Jamie's hand, Jamie let go of his coattails and off the leprechaun scampered. When Eileen heard what he had done, she was furious. Jamie O'Rourke, you're not only the laziest man in Ireland, but a fool as well, giving up a pot of gold for a pratty seed. Well, I'm going to plant this seed and water it, and you'll see. Jamie said, and out he went. And Faith, Eileen did see, in no time at all, the biggest, finest potato plant had sprouted out of the ground, followed by the potato itself. It was so big it pushed up not only all the dirt in the garden, but the garden shed and the corner of the cottage as well. Well, surely now it's ready to dig, Jamie said proudly. He hoed all around it, but he couldn't dig up that pratty out of the ground. He got a beam and a big rock and tried to pry it out. He pushed and he pushed, but it wouldn't budge. As he was pondering what to do, his neighbor passed by on his way to the village. He couldn't believe his eyes. He couldn't wait to tell everybody in the village what he had seen, and before you knew it, the hill up to Jamie's was filled with villagers coming to see the big potato. Where did it come from? they asked. Jamie told them about the lucky night he had caught the leprechaun and how smart he had been. Why, anyone could have gotten a pot of gold, he bragged, but the biggest pratty in the world? Well, that took some doing. However, did you outsmart a leprechaun? they all asked at once. Jamie hesitated and scratched his head. We'll help you dig up your pratty, Jamie, if you'll tell us how you did it. And they grabbed shovels and hoes and started to dig. They dug and they dug and they pushed and they shoved until the potato flew up out of its hole. It rolled down the hill faster and faster until it reached the bottom, where it bounced up high and came to a stop wedged between the stone walls on either side of the road. What to do now? That pratty is so big that no one, no cart, nothing, can get by it, the constable complained to Father O'Malley. How's a body to get in or out of the village? What shall we do? the villagers wailed. Then they all looked at Jamie and said, It's your pratty. You'll have to move it out of our way. Well, Eileen spoke up, there's more than enough pratty for everyone. Why don't you all take some? So the villagers sawed and chopped and carted off huge pieces of potato, 
while Jamie sat on the stone wall and watched. All winter long, everyone had potato to eat and eat and eat until no one wanted to see or hear of potato again. In the spring, Jamie said, I saved a potato eye for a seed and it's just about time to plant it. Oh no, the villagers all cried. If you promise not to plant it, Jamie, we'll promise before St. Patrick and all the saints to see that you and Eileen always have plenty to cook and eat. We don't want another giant pratty around here. Jamie smiled and agreed. What a perfect life for a lazy man. And so you see, darling Eileen, Jamie told her. I wasn't such a fool with that leprechaun after all. And Eileen had to admit that Jamie O'Rourke was right. And that is the end of Jamie O'Rourke and the Big Potato, an Irish folk tale, retold and illustrated by Tommy DePaula. The first poem I'm reading is called Leprechaun, Leprechaun. Leprechaun, Leprechaun, where is your pot of gold? Is it hidden in the meadow where the green shamrocks grow? Or do you keep it safely tucked at the rainbow's end to charm the dreams of children and other elfish friends? The next book I'm reading is called Patrick, Patron Saint of Ireland. This is written and illustrated by Tommy DePaula. And Saint Patrick was a real historical figure who lived over 1500 years ago. And his story is part of the rich heritage and history of Ireland. Included in this book are a few legends about St. Patrick, which may or may not be true, but I think you're going to enjoy Patrick, Patron Saint of Ireland. Patrick, Patron Saint of Ireland by Tommy DePaula. Patrick, Patron Saint of Ireland. Patrick, Patron Saint of Ireland by Tommy DePaula, Holiday House, New York. To my Irish mother, Flossie Downey DePaula. Special thanks to my studio assistant, Raphael Nos, for his generous help. Many years ago, during the time of the Christian Roman Empire, there lived a boy named Patrick. He lived with his noble family in Britain, near the Irish Sea. One night, fierce Irishmen from the island across the water came in their boats and raided the farms on the British mainland. They captured many people, Patrick among them. They took him back to Ireland and sold him as a slave to a man named Miliuk. Now that I own you, said Miliuk, I will take you to Mount Slemish, where you shall watch my sheep. For six years in the strange and pagan land, Patrick, who was used to warm clothes, good food, and a nice house, was a shepherd, and he was very lonely. All he could do was pray to God over and over and over again, a hundred times during the day, a hundred times during the night, and he felt the love of God in his heart. Patrick's prayers did not go unanswered. During his sleep, a voice came to him. It is a good thing that you fast and pray, for soon you will go to your own country. See, your ship is ready. The ship was more than 200 miles away, but that didn't stop Patrick. Believing in the strength of God, Patrick went on his way, fearing nothing. Now the ship was filled with hunting hounds that were being taken to France to be sold to rich people. When the hounds saw Patrick, they stopped barking and began to wag their tails. Patrick offered to pay for his passage, but the captain worried that he might be an escaped slave and said, I cannot take you with us. Get off my ship. So Patrick left. He began to pray that the captain would change his mind. The hounds started to howl. Those hounds were fine when that fellow was here, said one of the men. But now they're making so much noise, they'll raise the dead. Run and get him, said the captain, or else we will have no peace on our journey. 
Patrick's prayers were answered. He was allowed to board the ship, and it set sail. After three days, the ship landed. The countryside was deserted because there had been a war. For 28 days, the men and the hounds traveled through the desolate land, finally overcome with hunger. Tell me, Christian, the captain said, you say that your God is great and all-powerful. Why don't you pray for us then? Can't you see how hungry we are? Nothing is impossible for my God, Patrick answered. This day he will send food to us. Suddenly, a herd of pigs appeared on the road in front of them, oinking and squealing. The men caught and killed them. For two days, everyone, including the dogs, had plenty to eat, and they did not go hungry again. Soon, Patrick left the little group and traveled alone for two years. When he finally arrived back home in Britain, his family rejoiced and begged him never to leave them again. Once more, Patrick had a dream. This time, a man named Victoricus appeared to him. Victoricus had come from Ireland with an armload of letters. He gave one of them to Patrick. It read, The Voice of the Irish. Then Patrick heard voices calling from the woods, Come and walk among us again. Patrick woke up. He wasn't sure what the dream meant. A few nights later, Patrick heard more voices calling to him, and then he knew what he must do. He must return to Ireland and take the people the good news of God. Although it was hard to part with his family, Patrick left home to study and become a missionary. Finally, he was ready to sail for Ireland and take the word of God to the Irish people. He sold his worldly goods, bought all he needed for his work, and hired a boat. A huge crowd went along to help him. Priests, bakers, chariot drivers, all kinds of people. Patrick was now a bishop, and the work that God had planned for him was about to begin. Shortly after the ship landed in Ireland, Patrick met a chieftain who was a good and kind man. The chieftain's name was Dishu, and he listened to Patrick talk of his love of God. He believed everything that Patrick told him and asked Patrick to baptize him into the new faith. Dishu gave Patrick the barn that became the first church in Ireland. But not everything that happened to Patrick was so easy. Patrick's chariot driver, Odrin, overheard that a king planned to kill Patrick. Odrin wanted to protect his master. Bishop Patrick, he said, would you be so kind as to drive the chariot today? I am very tired. So Patrick agreed. As they were driving, the king threw his spear and killed Odrin, thinking he was the bishop. Patrick escaped. But he was sad, knowing that his friend Odrin had given up his life to protect him. Patrick faced many other dangers, too. In fact, he came close to losing his life twelve times, but that didn't stop him. Through the years, he traveled many, many miles and baptized thousands of people. On March 17, 461, Patrick died. Patrick's love of God had been so great that shortly after his death, churches were built all over the land, and Patrick was made a saint. Young men and women became monks and priests and nuns. They served the people of Ireland in the churches, monasteries, and schools. They traveled to other lands preaching the love of God, just as Patrick had done when he came to the Emerald Isle. And even to this day, the Irish love their patron saint, Patrick. There are many legends about St. Patrick. Here are a few of them. St. Patrick and the Snakes Some people say there are no snakes in Ireland because St. Patrick drove them out. Just as he had driven out sin, Patrick got rid of the snakes by beating a drum hard and fast. The snakes couldn't stand the noise, so they slithered into the sea. 
St. Patrick and the Lost Horses One dark night, Patrick's chariot driver lost his horses. It was so dark that he couldn't even look for them. Patrick raised his hand, and each of his five fingers lit up. In the light, the chariot driver was able to find his lost horses. St. Patrick and the Evil Coroticus Coroticus was a cruel ruler. He persecuted Christians. Patrick sent him a letter asking him to stop, but Coroticus paid no attention to it. When Patrick heard this, he prayed to God to punish the evil ruler. Right in front of all of Coroticus's followers, God changed Coroticus into a fox. The fox ran off and was never seen again. St. Patrick and the Altar Stone St. Patrick was returning to Ireland from a visit to Rome. He had a large altar stone with him. The captain of the ship that was to take Patrick on the last leg of the journey refused to take the stone on board. There's no room, he said, and besides, that stone is too heavy. Patrick got angry at the captain. He picked up the stone and threw it behind the boat. The stone floated, and Patrick sat on it, riding the stone all the way home in the wake of the ship. St. Patrick and the Shamrock When St. Patrick was preaching about the Holy Trinity, the people could not understand that there was one God in three divine persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Patrick looked down, and growing at his feet was a shamrock. He picked it and held it up, showing that there was one stem but three leaves. The people understood the Holy Trinity at once. And that is the end of Patrick, Patron Saint of Ireland, written and illustrated by Tommy DePaula. The next poem is filled with fantasy. It's called Wee Little Patrick. Wee Little Patrick. Patrick is a leprechaun. He has a sack of gold. He hides it in a special place between two stumps, I'm told. I think I once saw Patrick out in the woods at play. He smiled and laughed and winked his eye, and then he ran away. The third and final story I'm reading today, boys and girls, is called Clever Tom and the Leprechaun. It's an Irish folk tale that's been retold and illustrated by Linda Shute. It's part of the rich folklore of Ireland, and I know you're going to enjoy Clever Tom and the Leprechaun. Clever Tom and the Leprechaun by Linda Shute. This story is retold from The Field of Bullions, included by folklorist T. Crofton Crocker in Legends and Traditions of the South of Ireland, 1825. An old Irish story, Clever Tom and the Leprechaun, retold and illustrated by Linda Shute, Scholastic Incorporated. To Libby Thompson with Love, Clever Tom and the Leprechaun. One fine day on Lady Day in the harvest, Tom Fitzpatrick took a ramble down the lane. Click, clack, click, clack, he heard through the hedge. So Tom tiptoed closer to take a look. The clacking sound stopped when Tom peeped through the bushes. And in the shadow, what did he see? Why, a big gallon pitcher and a teeny tiny man with a brown leather apron and a tree-cornered hat. Up the small man climbed on his wee wooden stool and dipped his little pig in, in the crock. Then he settled down with his full mug beside him to hammer on the heel of a fairy-sized shoe. By the powers, thought Tom, it's a leprechaun. If I catch him and scare him, he'll give me his gold. Since I'm a clever fellow, that should be simple. Before the sun sets, I'll have my fortune made. Tom stared at the leprechaun and tried not to blink. He knew that if he looked away, the old man would escape. Then he crept up quite near and tipped his hat politely, saying, Good day to your neighbor. Blessings on your work. Thank you kindly, 
said the small one, but he never looked up. He just kept on tapping at the heel piece of the rogue. Tom moved his hand closer while he smiled very sweetly and said, Today's a holiday. You shouldn't have to work. The leprechaun frowned and answered Tom sharply. If I do, that's my business and none of your own. Instead of pestering me, young man, you ought to be watching your father's fields. Look there, the cows have broke into the oats. See, they're knocking the corn all about. Cows in the cornfield? Tom's head started turning. But he wasn't fooled by the leprechaun's trick. Quickly he grabbed the sly fella and cried, Now you're my prisoner. Tell me where is your gold? And the leprechaun wiggled and twisted and whined, I'm just a poor man. But Tom held him fast. You and I both know you're lying, said Tom. And he made a fierce fighting face. Finally, the leprechaun quit squirming and said, Tom Fitzpatrick, you're too clever for me. I see you're after me buried treasure, so I'll have to show you where it is hid. With his eye on the bitty man locked in his fist, Tom followed where the leprechaun led him. He traipsed over a hill and under some hedges, and through a ditch and across the peat bog. At last, just when Tom feared he'd been hoodwinked, he found himself in a great field of weeds. Dig there, said the leprechaun, pointing to a bush. Deep under that bullion is where I put my gold. Thunderation, said Tom. I need to fetch my spade, but when I return, I'll be lost. There are 40 acres of bullions here, and each plant looks just like the other. Still watching the leprechaun, Tom figured out a plan. He tied his bright red garter on the bush. Swear, you old rascal, that you won't take this off while I run back to get my spade. That I will promise you. The little man said. Tom grinned, knowing leprechauns always keep their word. Now, since I have shown you where my treasure is, I don't suppose you'll need me anymore. No, said Tom. My fortune's made. You may go and good luck go with you. Then goodbye, Tom Fitzpatrick, said the leprechaun. May you do much good with what you find. Away Tom ran as fast as he could run figuring how he'd spend the gold. Then back he came with his shovel in his hand, back to the field of bullions. But when he got there, lo and behold, a garter just like his own was tied to each and every bush as far as he could see. Tom dug under the bullion where he thought he'd tied his garter. But nothing was buried under that bush, and so he dug under another. He dug to the east and he dug to the west, and still he found no treasure. The harvest moon rose as he dug to the north, and it set as he dug southward. When the sun came up, Tom saw he dug a hundred holes, and tired Tom Fitzpatrick knew he couldn't find that gold. So he gave up and headed for home. From then on, Tom always carried his spade and he never stopped listening for a tapping in the field. Every chance he got, he'd tell how he nearly found the gold. And since I am a clever fellow, Tom would end his tale. The next time I catch that leprechaun, I'll have my fortune made. And that is the end of Clever Tom and the Leprechaun, written and illustrated by Linda Shute. I've had a wonderful time with you today, boys and girls, and I hope you enjoyed all the stories and poems and even the little song and dance in celebration of St. Patrick's Day. If you haven't yet subscribed to this channel, you can do so. Just tap the word subscribe right there, and that way you'll be sure to get all the latest videos with stories and poems for meeting with Mrs. Adams. You can even tap the bell to get notifications and I'd love it if you commented to let me know how you're enjoying the stories that I read to you. One truth I want you always to remember, and that is that God loves you so much. 
So dare to dream the impossible because all things are possible with God. I love you. Until next time, goodbye.